I do want to take just a moment to introduce Dr. Mitten. Uh, we're very excited to have you here, Denise. Uh, if I were to go over the entirety of your resume, it would take all the rest of this webinar. But Denise is currently uh, serving as the chair of the Adventure Education Master's Program at Prescott College. Uh, her experience spans the, the realm of experiential education, uh, both in types of programs and populations, you name it, she has done it longtime contributor uh, and friend to the Association for Experiential Education, past Kurt Hahn Award winner. The list goes on and on, but I think I found a quote from Denise that sums it up pretty well, and that is, I combine my backgrounds in sustainability, science, nonprofit managing, corporate work, counseling, complementary medicine, higher education, and adventure trip leading to help students discover the tools and skills they need to continue passionate, high-quality work that positively contributes to the global community. I think that sums it up really well. And Denise, once again, we're so excited to have you here. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on over to you so we can get started. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, AEE, for hosting this webinar. Uh, welcome everybody who are here. So the first thing we'll do is a, a fun little exercise, I think. Can you please, on the thing that Dan said to you, raise your hand. And if you can't figure out how to technically raise your hand using the technology, just raise your hand for a minute. So everybody raise your hand and I am going to read a list of names. As you um, come to a name that you don't know, put your hand down. And it's fine to re-raise your hand if you get a name you know, but basically when you come to a name you don't know, put your hand down. Let's give this a try. Everybody raise your hand. Harriet Tubman, Marie Montessori, Rachel Carson, Arlene Bloom, Junko Tabayu, Stagecoach Mary, Georgie Clark White, Gwen Moffat, Mariana Elwald, Alexander David Neal, Miriam Underhill. Isako Tanaka, Isabella Bird Bishop, Mina Benson Hubbard, Annie Peck, Christine Bonavive, Fanny Bullock Workman, Constance Helmrichs, Colette Richards. All right, anybody's hands still up? Uh, we lost him. We lost him several people ago, Denise. All right, well, what did these people have in common? If you want to answer anything, you're welcome to type in the chat. What do these people have in common? These are many of the people, women, on whose shoulder we stand. On whose shoulders we stand. And these are some of the women that I'll talk about today. And we will, um, basically today what we're going to do is an informal look. This includes snippets about many women's lives in terms of how their lives intersected with adventuring, some of their motivations, some of their approaches, a piece is about leadership style. And primarily what you might get from this is how early women adventurers defied socialization, defied socialization. And there are many more stories, hundreds, maybe thousands that you can find now. You're welcome to write and say, hey, what about this woman? I may not know about her and I'd love knowing about them. All are welcome. This is a history that's been hidden from us. Now the internet has helped incredibly. Still, I get contradictory information. For some folks, I still cannot find birth dates or death dates. What I thought I knew in 1979 when I started this research and in the early 80s has been corrected some is revisionist history. The bottom line is there are many ways to interpret the lives and because of the lack of record keeping, there are discrepancies. The women I highlight here are in order of birth. There are few women of color and indigenous women. That history is more hidden, though we will uncover more all the time. I started this work when I worked with Woods Women which was an organization 
For 20 years, it helped women and women and children learn about living and traveling outdoors. The Wikipedia site is listed there and Dan can help people find that too. He'll have all of this. In 1808, a French maidservant, Marie or Maria Paradis, became the first woman to ascend Mount Blanc, thereby establishing her place in women's mountaineering history. Her success was followed by that of a wealthy French countess, Henriette de Angeville, who successfully summited about 30 years later, 19, 1838. In her account of her ascent that has been translated to English in 1992, de Angeville urged women mountaineers to write narratives of their mountaineering, arguing it is that it was important that they write the feminine stamp or feminine experience of mountaineering. Knowing more about these women can help in culture making, and we're all involved in culture making all the time, which is altering the perceptions and constructs of who is outdoors and why people are outdoors? Let's try the hand raising again. If you've traveled more than 13,000 miles outside during your outdoor career, raise your hand. Or do something, say something to the person well, next to you. We got, we got three or four that say they've traveled that far. Great. Now, <clears throat> This next person that I'm going to highlight was born in 1822, and she exemplified perseverance, motivation, traveling and living skills in the outdoors for the betterment of our culture. Harriet Tubman led at least 13 groups of African Americans to freedom, traveling over 1,000 miles each trip. She started at the Eastern Shore of Maryland and traveled to the end of the Underground Railroad in St. Catharines, Canada. She traveled mostly at night. She traveled using the North Star or the water gourd as it was known in the Underground Railroad language to travel north. Her first trip, she was alone and in her early 20s and she traveled at night to Philadelphia using off-road travel. What can we learn from Harriet Tubman and her leadership styles that we don't know? Turns out that she and Susan B. Anthony were born about the same year. Again, there's discrepancy, especially with Harriet Tubman's birth. And they worked together at some points in their life for women's vote and women's suffragette pieces. Isabella Bird Bishop is an English woman who got the vapors. She was actually a semi-invalid at home. Her doctor prescribed travel. Her first trip was to, to the United States and Canada. Afterwards, she wrote two books, one titled My Life in the Rockies. She also traveled down the Yancey River and, and, and probably 18 more countries. Whenever she got the vapors, she would then travel. She was a wealthy woman, so she could follow those doctor's prescriptions. In fact, on the left is her in a Manchurian dress after one of her adventures. And in that picture, she's um, in her 60s. She did several large expeditions after she was 50 and she lived into her 70s. Her books exemplify a trend that is evident in other women's writings. Women don't typically picture themselves successfully on the top of the mountains, but rather one step from disaster. In this picture up here, they're on a precipitous ledge. In this down here, it was self-deprecating. I could not keep away from his hooves. This theme you'll see in more women's writing. Understatement, self-deprecating. By the way, when she was 61 years old, she was the first woman to address the Royal Geographic Society in England. A quote of hers that I like, I always feel dull and inactive when I'm stationary. Loneliness is dreadful. When traveling, I don't feel it. That's why I can never stay anywhere. Sacagawea. Most of us have heard of Sacagawea. She either lived only until 1812 or 1884. That is the interesting part of history. 
because kind of romanticized is that she didn't really die in 1812, but she lived longer and we just didn't know where she was. And I certainly hope that's true. She was a Lemmy Shoshone woman, and she helped, as we, most of us probably know, the Lewis and Clark expedition. She exemplified another thing that women bring to expeditions. About two months into the expedition, she gave birth to a baby who accompanied them on the expedition. She um, tended to symbolize that the expedition came in peace. And she was very excellent at establishing relationships with all the other people that they met in the way. She did not have an easy life. At 13, she was sold in a non-consensual marriage to a Quebec trapper. And she was, had another, you know, several other children, some died. She apparently either died or completely disappeared in 1812. But actually Clark, one of the expedition leaders, helped her children for the rest of their lives, which was kind of him. But she, really exemplified that token of peace in their party. Another early adventurer was Stagecoach Mary. She was the first African-American woman on the Star Route Mail Carrier System. She won two contracts. She actually used a horse and carriage, or horse and, and a wagon to do her stuff, and she was out in all kinds of weather. Lozen. This is a terrible picture. Why would I use this in a slide show? Because that's the only picture we have. It's on her way to prison. And she lived, um, you know, not that long, but she was a Chihin Chiricahua Apache warrior and prophet. She led dozens of women and children to safety, to freedom. There's one talk about her crossing the Rio Grande River where she um, went with her horse first and, and inspired the women and children to follow her. They got across safely and she was able to help them escape the killing that would have happened by the colonizers at that time. Annie Peck Smith was a mountaineer adventurer. She was a suffragette. And now as we get into the early 1900s of women adventuring, you'll see that many women adventured and they said, well, I'm not doing this just for me. I'm doing this, as Fanny Bullock work said, to get votes for women. So here she is in the Karakoram with a placard about votes for women. She was a professional mountaineer. She wrote eight books. She wrote these books with her husband and traveled um, a many places Again, depicting yourself not on too many summits unless she had a placard in her hand to say she was getting votes for women and helping women get the vote, which actually we're still not in the Constitution, are we? The ERA was not ratified by enough states, although we can vote now. Here she is on a trip to India. Alexandra David Neal. She had an obsession. She wanted to meet the Dalai Lama. She was a Buddhist person. She spent three years, three months, three weeks, three hours, three days, three minutes in a cave. And she wanted to meet the Dalai Lama. People were not allowed in Tet who were Westerners at that time. Well, defying all odds, and she was over 50, on her third attempt, and she disguised herself as a Tibetan woman beggar with a son, she managed to go to the Dalai Lama, Lhasa, and get counsel with him. Another thing she did that was kind of amazing, if you see her on the right, she lived quite, quite elderly. She um, did a reverse mortgage. She sold her land in France because she didn't have a lot of money. And she said, you can have it as long as I can live there till I die. And frankly, she sold it when she was in her 60s and she lived to be, as you can see, 101. So for those of you out there, reverse mortgage may be something fun. Faye Fuller, she was the first woman to reach the summit of Mount Rainier. In a hundred years later, in um, 19, in the, in the 19, um, let's see, Kathy Phibbs, who was a mountaineer in the Northwest. She started Witzelman 
Northwest, and she also started the um, Women Climbers Northwest. She, along with the help of the organization Woodsman that I ran, did a 100-year memorial climb for Faye Fuller. 33 women climbed Mount Rainier. We had a special permit. One of those women uh, lost a leg when she was 12 to cancer, and so she became the second woman who had lost a leg to be able to summit Mount Rainier. But honoring these women is awfully fun. Marie Montessori, I mentioned her because she was outside a lot. She knew how important nature was in education. She knew that child's development depended on that time in the outdoors. Mina Bunsen Hubbard, her story depicts several different things. She decided to go to the outdoors because she was overwhelmed with grief. Her husband that she had just married, Laddie, died um, while mapping the George River and she wanted to finish his work. She was surprised how much she enjoyed the outdoors. She said, I loved it. Uh, what did I care of mosquitoes when I'm free? Some of us still care about mosquitoes, that's okay. And she does have a head net on the left-hand side. So during that trip, she sat in the middle of the canoe each day. She was not allowed to paddle. This was in 1905. She was looked at askance because her skirts were three inches above the ground. In 1982, we also did a trip to commemorate her work. And there were seven women on the trip. One of their aunties made them a dress like Mina Hubbard and they traded each day being the duffer or the person sitting in the middle of the canoe. That the um, George River has plenty of white water and plenty of pieces to for excitement. The trips end, Mina was so surprised. She kept saying, I just, I'm surprised how I love this out here. I love being outdoors. Well, she had two Indian guides with her, indigenous guides, George Ellison and Job. On her trip, Job would have dreams and they would follow them. Like Job might say, I dream that as we go around this rapid, we should stay on the left-hand side of the bend. She honored that way of knowing. There's no way to know if that was accurate or not. However, on Laddie's trip, Job had a dream that if they went over this rise, they would be where they were supposed to be, not be lost. Turns out, Job was right, but the, the um, European men said, nope, we don't trust dreams, and unfortunately, they perish. Very different. Laddie and the men that Laddie was with, they were quoting Kipling and thinking like something lost behind the rages, lost and waiting for you, rather than Mina's approach of, wow, this is beautiful out here. I love it. And I feel home, at home. Turns out that Dylan Wallace, the second in command from Laddie, thought that he should finish Laddie's work. He launched an expedition. It started two weeks before Mina's. Mina's expedition finished after, before his, so they must have passed each other, but neither of them mentioned each other. I don't think they really liked each other. So Wallace in his book, so we have two books to compare of the same time period. He was quoting more about the time for action had come. Our lonely, perilous journey towards the dismal waste. These are two very different ways of seeing the outdoors. And that's the difference we see in literature written by men and literature written by women. The relationship piece comes up again. Me, Benson Hubbard, talked to the Niscopi people. She interacted with them and she called them Niscopi women. She, she did not call them, as Dylan Wallace did, a more derogatory name of Eskimo or a group of Eskimo women, the Labrador type. Dress in the outdoors seem to be concurrent with some of women's emancipation. And um, there's been some writing, especially from um, Dr. Grunholt in Norway, about the emancip emancipation with women coincides with the emancipation of our clothing. This is Norway's first female professor, Christine Bovin, on a glacier hike with her colleagues. Again, most of the dress still looks rather restrictive perhaps to us, but they do have bloomers underneath and their dresses are about, you know, six to 10 inches above the ground. 
not dragging on the ground. It makes a huge difference. Freda de Fuhr was an Australian mountaineer, and she was the first woman to climb Mount Oraki or Mount Cook in New Zealand. Her book, Between Heaven and Earth, uh, the book about her, is an excellent read. I highly recommend it. Two women, Mabel Reed and Mary Ellicott Arnold, were Indian agents. In the early 1900s, that was a common job, but uncommon for women to do it. Their book, In the Land of the Grasshopper Song, shows how instead of going out as the government wanted and them to affect the Indians or the Native Americans in Klamath region, they actually were affected by the indigenous people. And they, um, they were social justice advocates their whole life, uh, uh, especially Mary Arnold was a, um, a friend's um, Quaker. And something that is not often acknowledged in history, these two women uh, were in a lesbian relationship and are actually buried together in a Quaker cemetery in Media, Pennsylvania. Maureen Elwood, she is actually the person who started the expeditionary concept. In about 1925, she was, she was the co-coordinator and co-founder of Solemn School with Kurt Hahn. She went on an expedition and uh, first to Finland and they had plenty of, of challenges and things happen and then she did, she was a geographer and then she did an expedition to Greenland. But one of the little known facts is that Kurt Hahn suffered a sunstroke in high school. And so after high school, he was not able to spend virtually any time outside uncovered or hardly at all outside. The sunstroke is known because he's very famous for saying your disabilities become your strengths. And at the same time, he didn't go on an expedition or do the expeditionary thing. But to his credit, he knew a good thing when he saw it. And when two men went to um, Germany a few years ago, they looked at Hans' personal papers. And this is where Hans said that Elwad was the co-founder of Salem, partner in all major decisions. She started the expeditionary learning piece, started sailing, a sailing program at the school and was sure, at least on the sailing program, that women were just as involved as men. In the expeditions, they tended to be all male students and her as they expeditioned all in Northern Europe and, and to Greenland. But that's where we have this wonderful concept of how much learning can happen as we travel in the outdoors together as a group of people. She was unknown until these guys went to Germany. Now you can find a little bit about her on the internet, thanks to them, which is good. And I've even found a paper that she published in 1975, one year before her death. After Han left to go to the UK because he would be in prison because of the Nazi regime in Germany, I almost said the US, the Nazi regime in Germany, um, because of that, she stayed for 50 years and headed up the Islam school. In the 20s, the camping movement was big in the US. And with that, in 1915, this journal article talked about canoeing, the double paddle very easy. How many of us knew that the single paddle is more expert? Women were still depicted in a little odd poses. I'm not sure anybody would portage this way, and I haven't seen a man, in, a man in this pose in the magazines. On the portage on the left, using a paddle like a bat, yet carrying the canoes. Funny story, in the movie on Golden Pond, um, Audrey Hepburn, in the filming of it, portaged a canoe. Turns out when they finished the film, they didn't put her in there portaging the canoe because they thought it made her look too strong. Well, because of that, she got a little cranky and boycotted the film, was not happy that she was not shown portaging that canoe. These two women are putting their canoe again into the water, and that's because they were paddling, and the person in the front back then was actually the person who steered the boat. 
and she was the more expert in this case. So she was steering the boat, everything was going on, and she lost her paddle. The woman in the back had to begin to steer and paddle the boat too, in through these white waters. And she did that, and reading the account is very much like watching, oh, Catherine Hepburn again on the African Queen, when she went through the waters and said, delicious, delicious, I have never felt like that in my life. And became a canoeist after that, even with the long skirts. Anuta Ford Blackman was an, an Inuit woman who came to the United States. Now, it was a circuitous route because she was born in the Baffalin Islands. She did some, um, she went to Labrador, was married, had, had a child, lost a child. And finally, and she was, the story goes that she went to the train station and said, I'm buying a ticket to the United States. Where would you go? And the, the uh, train person said, I would go to Indianapolis because that's where I'm from. So she ended up in Indianapolis. Well, interestingly enough, she is written about and wrote a chapter in The Land of the Good Shadows. During the early 1900s, again in that, in that uh, 1920s, 30s, 40s time, a number of people who were Native American would um, actually give talks to children, to schools, to churches, to rotary clubs about what it was like to be an indigenous person. And there was a romanticism to this, something called the, the noble savage, and in that way, she would dress in her Inuit dress, and then she would give these talks. And it was romanticized. It was romanticized about the Inuit people. She would talk about how, uh, try to, try, try to take, take away some of the myths, like that they never bathed, or they went into their igloos on their hands and knees, or whatever the myths were. But she would also romanticize them about how, and she exemplified this, how happy, how carefree, how kind, how basically perfect they were. Um, interestingly enough, she got her name because a, a man was hunting and he died that day that she was born. And the person who raised her named her after Anukta and also raised her basically as, as a male. And she had both English and Native American blood or, or Native blood up in the Baffling Islands. Um, and yep, another good read. So, um, Baffling Islands up in the Hudson Bay, down to Indianapolis. Post-World War II, there was a boon in climbing. I don't know if it's a boon or a boom, but there was one of those. She wrote Climbing Days, 1935. Pretty amazing. Uh, she loved to climb with her husband, Dan Richards. And at the same time, this is the start of the period where women were saying, you know, I kind of either like to climb with women or be able to get on top first because they always had to follow. They could never lead. And this became a theme. Now, in the early 1900s, or even, I guess it was the late 1800s, the Pinnacles Club. Now, Dorothy is the second from the left. And it looks like an African-American woman is the second from the right in the back. More research is needed. Well, there were several women's Pinnacle clubs or mountaineering clubs started in that time period. Keeping with that theme, Miriam Underhill decided to actually label it manless climbing because she said to her guy friends that she climbed with, including her husband, I'd like to step on the top first. And again, they said, so Zyra, you can't do that. You're with us. Look at that little bowling around a coil around her waist. There were no harnesses then. And my goodness, so there she is climbing in tennis shoes. So she started manless climbing. And it was quite a thing in the 40s, 50s. Still, when things are written about women, and there's, you can see the strong wind that's taking the rope out in that picture, a strong wind bothers a lady, though she has no skirt to worry about. Keeping with that theme of emancipating women is also emancipating our clothing, our clothing. In the olden days, going a Tyrolean Traverse was very common as a day to go out and have fun. Her book, um, The Space Beneath My Feet, is also an excellent read. Another reason to go outside, the sciences. 
I love, I love ecology and being outdoors. Well, Nicole Maxwell went down to the Amazon. Something happened and she had a terrible cut in her arm. She was about ready to bleed to death. A local shaman fed her something. She drank it and voila, the blood stopped. Well, that turned her life around. She decided to dedicate her life to traveling in the Amazon, being a witch doctor's apprentice and locating all these amazing cure-offs that she thought the pharmacy companies would want to know about. People were very worried about her because they said that, what is a white woman doing traveling alone in that country? Aren't you scared? And she would counter that as, I don't think so, to these people. My skin is as white as the underbelly of a fish and not very desirable. So she was trying to put to bed that little myth that white women have to worry when they interact with indigenous people. Uh, Rachel Carson did a great deal of experiential education and outdoor projects with children. She, uh, wrote articles about experiencing awe, A-W-E in nature, the importance of that, the importance of development with children being outdoors so that we'd have a more peaceful culture, a more peaceful society. How many of you might have swum the 125 mile Colorado River through the Grand Canyon? Um, maybe some, probably not a lot, because uh, it's actually was, this is the first known time that somebody has lived during, during it. And she met this woman, Harry, she met this man, get those gender pronouns all mixed up all the time. So this is about Georgie Clark White. Her motivation to be outdoors was also grief. She and her husband biked to California early in their relationship. They lived out there. They um, had a daughter and she, when the daughter was 16, Georgie Clark White and she were biking on the um, Route 1. Daughter was killed by a car. And that was in the 19, early 1940s. So Georgie Clark White was overwhelmed with grief. Traveled, kind of bummed around until she met Harry Allison and the Grand Canyon. And she said, let's swim it. Turned out they did and nobody expected them to live they did, and, they, and she found a spiritual home. She loved the Grand Canyon. She wanted to make it accessible to women and children as well as men. She used to um, let reporters come on the trip and then say, okay, so then try to get more women and children down here. She, she found out that many of them were taking pictures of fake scorpions, fake tarantulas and snakes, and then saying only the hardiest can be down there in the Grand Canyon. She was quite a feisty woman. She usually wore a leopard skin, and she would heckle these people who were, were so inconsiderate. She coined a term, the Royal River Rat Society, that everybody was able to join at the end of the trips. So in addition to having the spiritual transformation and wanting women on the trips, she also had a very wild side, and at the end of the trips would pour beer over everybody's head. How many people have spent 12 years living off the grid? Well, Constance Helmerich, who is still alive, was able to talk her then husband into going to um, the Arctic, going to Alaska. And um, he, he was living, they were living in Arizona. So for those of you who know Arizona, the Arctic is a far cry. Turns out she wrote about four or five books they had, a, they had a good time there, she, she was into it, but food was hard. And this caption is, we eat at last. Eventually, in 1945, they leave, they leave. So, she loved being free, she loved being up there. Eventually, they had two children divorced, and then she decided that her two girls needed to go down the McKinsey River, which is about a thousand miles. So they flew into the top of the McKinsey River, they went down. In her books, like many of the others, you can see relationship with the people they met along the way highlighted and their relationships. 
interesting story on this. One daughter was 14-ish and one was 10-ish. The 10-year-old got appendicitis in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, mom diagnosed it. Somehow they were in a small village. They were able to get the flight plane in. Kid got out. This was even in, you know, this was in like the 50s or maybe the 60s. And kid was fine. So then she's traveling with this 14-year-old. And if you've ever been around 14-year-olds, so the 14-year-old was a little like, sure, I'm doing this trip on the McKinsey River and I decided to bring my mom along. Wasn't that nice of me? And mom went along with that just fine. And this woman, Audrey Sutherland, also was a writer. And she started writing in the, um, in, in the, in the 50s and 60s. But she moved to, as a single parent with her daughter, to Hawaii. Every year she would go on a personal adventure by, after her child was 16. And she wrote a list for her child of everything a 16-year-old should be able to do, including changing a tire of a car in case you had a, an accident and your tire flat, and listening to an adult with empathy. So she used to um, rent or borrow forest service cabins, both in Hawaii and in Alaska, to do her writing. Every year, her vessel that she went on her personal adventure got a little larger, and she would go in these incredible places in Hawaii and write about the area and what she saw and how it transformed her and the beauty of the pieces. Our first recorded or known women's expedition in Nepal to go mountaineering. Now, this is a wonderful piece of, of um, history because Monica, Betty, and Evelyn went over there. They had a permit, but they were, that permit was taken away and they had to go to this area between Nepal and Tibet that virtually was unexplored. They did a couple things different than many. They, they, because they were also mapping, they had to name some things. They named the summit of the 22,000 foot peak they ascent, they did the first ascent of after their head Sherpa Guidelin. They also spent time making, if they went over a pass that nobody had been over before, they built chortons so as a way to honor the native or the indigenous way of doing things. <clears throat> a huge thing is that they were the first, but it's not like they meant to be the first. They really were having fun doing this expedition. So they avoided the press as much as possible and didn't want to play up that factor that they were the first. I think that that's wonderful. I know that now we try to string enough things together to be the first, like the first all women's paddle trip down the Grand Canyon guided by women on March 14th. So I really encourage us to realize that the first doesn't really matter because as we look in history, we'll find more people who have gone before us. Very understated British understatement, looking for a glacier pass, I mean, this is in 1955. Now, I saw accounts where it was in 1953, 1954, 1955, and 1956. A new book came out in, reprinted their books, Tents in the Clouds, published in 2002, that I believe, I, actually, I believe that book says it's 1954. Another piece that comes out in their expedition is an understanding about group dynamics. Tend and befriend. We know now that if women throughout history did fight and flight, that the children might be left behind or the societies might have failed. And science is now understanding that women might not do tend and befriend as much as, as um, they don't do fight and flight, but they might do tend and befriend more. And they understood that that's why they were part of their indigenous people's uh, culture a little bit. They had two tents every third night because they would rotate. A, a person would get time alone in their alone tent. On the left, one thing they decided to do was to, as they said, splurge. And they named a glacier called the Ladies Glacier. So that they did name after themselves. Interestingly enough, now, one of them was a doctor, one a journalist, and one a teacher. In 2002, there was an expedi art expedition in Scotland about their trip, 
and they called them three housewives. I don't know how that happened. Gwen Moffat was the first woman certified climbing guide in 1953 in Wales. And she actually, as I start reading more, she did a, a short training with um, Evelyn, Monica, and Betty because they wanted to um, get better on their rope skills before they, before they went to Nepal. And so that was interesting that she was a trainer. Well, Gwen Moffat had quite a raucous history she joined the military, then she went AWOL, because really what she wanted to do was climb. Along the way, she was married and divorced a couple of times. She sent a ch her child back to her mom and then wrote romance and detective novels using a woman climbing guy as a heroine so her mom could sell these and feed the kid. No picture here. Phyllis Ford was an outdoor educator at the Oregon State University. She wrote a couple of books, one about the principles and practices of outdoor and environmental education, and the other, the very first in our long list of leadership and administration books in our fields. And we can't even find an obituary about her. Uh, she was also the, the uh, core advisor for a number of men in our field that we do read about and who have written the books after Phyllis Ford and who she trained. We found an obituary once, and then we tried to find it again and haven't been able to. But I have faith in the internet because more and more things are being found all the time. Another lost piece, Colette Richards wrote a book, Climbing Blind. She was French, and she would climb. She would also cave. She said in caving, her blindness was, her blindness was not a handicap. However, <clears throat> I can't find this book anywhere. So if anybody has it or anybody can help with that, that'd be awesome. The internet is failing me so far on that. 1975, Junko Dubai became the first woman to reach the summit of Mount Everest. She was trashed by the press because she left a two-year-old daughter at home. I would just like to know why. Now, <clears throat> the other thing about that 1995, 1975 expedition is that it was all women. Very early in her career, she started a women's climbing group in Japan to go climbing internationally. It was very hard to have integrated climbing teams at that time, and the men in Japan were not real excited to have women on their teams. She was the first woman that we have recorded to reach the seven summits. She finished all of them in 1992. This is a picture of her on Denali. Here's another short story about, a, about um, the kindness of women in the outdoors or just that relationship piece. Not that it wouldn't happen with other people too. So I was climbing Denali at this time. Uh, we were, we were uh, Kathy Phibbs and I were leading a group of women and we went up on the summit, but we got turned back with, with the snow and wind, things that happen out there. The next day, Kathy kindly said, Denise, you go first. So I took four women and we went to the top and came back. And then Kathy spent that extra day up there, which is harder, and took four women up to the top and came back. And on her way back, Joan, who was doing this climb as her 50th birthday present to herself, said, I don't think I can go any further without a cup of tea. And Kathy was a little worried because here she was at 20,000 feet, maybe 1998 feet, you know, and, and there was no tea up there. They rounded a bend and the tent flap opened of this tent that shouldn't have even been there. And a woman said, would you like a cup of tea? Well, Kathy said her jaw dropped and it was hard to get it back closed because it froze that way. No, but she was just so shocked. The group of five of them went in the tent, had a nice cup of tea, and went on their merry way. And that was Junko Tobayo and her friend, and they were climbing up Denali that time in order to ski down. Her books have not been translated into English, which would be an awful wonderful thing to know more about. She died of stomach cancer. At the end of her life, she was still taking school children up Mount Fuji uh, three months before she passed away. And she was in the Fukushima area, which is possibly how her stomach cancer happened. And in a later part of her life would take people walking in the woods and walking in the outdoors as a way to just relax because so many of the people in that area will die. 
more current people, Arlene Bloom, she led the first climb on Annapurna One for women, but the first successful climb of any American team. And she had a rich mountaineering career. She is also a chemist. And with her, she's a PhD that she works in the university system. And now her passion is understanding more about why we need to get rid of fire retardant chemicals in clothing that are killing children. <clears throat> Another Japanese woman, Yashuko Tanaka, she died in the 1996 fiasco on Everest. She also had completed the seven summits. Yet on that trip and in the book, at least one of the books written about that trip, she was portrayed as not a real mountaineer. And partly that's because she's extremely small. And um, a lot of small people are thought that to not be real climbers or real mountaineers or real much anything when they're five foot one or less in height. But she was left to die uh, in, in that fiasco. Kathy Phibbs was an excellent climber, started a number of expeditions, um, and she was the one that also headed up the uh, Faith Fuller 100th anniversary climb. Some of her things are in Seneca at the Women's uh, Museum there in, from her climbing period. We need to know more about indigenous women who are leaders in the outdoors all the time. And um, much of the time, we, we just, it's a history again that we don't think about looking at to understand more about leadership. We need to do this for the children who are coming up, who really are excited about being outdoors and want these role models and want to know who they are. We know that women in the outdoors love to have fun. They often think about the outdoors as a place of nurturing, a place of calmness, a place of coming home. And more just needs to be known so we can help change the culture of how we even think about the outdoors, or at least know there's options to how to think about the outdoors. If you want more information, there it, Dan will have like in the 80s, I put together a 14 page reading list of books by women adventurers. And that was before computers, so it was all typed. Poorly typed, but typed. In addition, Tonya Gray and I have uh, are coming out with a an edited book where we hear from 80 women who are in outdoor learning environments. And that's gonna be the Palgrave International Handbook on Women in Outdoor Learning Environments. So you can get more information um, about that. So please let me know if you have questions. Um, I'm on ResearchGate. Anything I have there is open source. I just want people to have it. If Dan will probably make this available on links. You can have that. So anything you want, if I have it, you can have it. There was um, a question from somebody that said, female all. I wasn't sure what that was, what that was in regards to. And um, yeah, so if you have any other questions, please put them down. We've gone through this quickly to just give you a taste. I mean, it's like, here you go. Just This is only a start. There are hundreds and thousands more women out there who have done these things. Denise, I want to answer your question. That was somebody answering your question at the very beginning of what did all those people have in common? Thank you. All female. They were all female. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and they were all the female adventurers that, yeah. We can definitely stick around to answer some questions. I do. I just want to give a little advice to all the people who just heard this amazing uh, gold mine of a presentation, right? This isn't really something you can just hear and then move on with your life and, and try to remember some of this stuff. I encourage you when we send out this recording to sort of keep it in your vault. If you're an educator, you work with students, you know, maybe, maybe take a look at it and find, all right, I'm going to remember about Marina Ellswald and I'm going to, when I talk about Outward Bound, I'm going to remember that story and that part of it. And I'm going to make sure when I teach about that, I'm going to add her name onto the list. Or the next time you have a student, who is you know, afraid of the whitewater experience you're about to provide and you wanna talk about uh, Georgie Clark White and how she swam the Grand Canyon and how she can do that, you can totally 
uh, get in this boat and paddle some whitewater with us. And uh, somebody who's afraid to go camping, you can talk about Constance and, and her 12 years in the Arctic. So you now have this toolbox to draw from. And I think about the, the countless hours that have been spent putting this information together. Thank you so much, Denise. Uh, well, thank you. And I see that Abby asked about <clears throat> grief in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. There is not enough research about that. I think it's one of the motivating factors. I can name a number of women who have been, um, and Abby, you have written about that. And Abby's, Abby's chapter will be in the book that Tonya Gray and I have, uh, are putting together that will be out soon from Palgrave to talk about grief and that relationship to being in the outdoors and the healing that can happen. So thank you, Abby, for asking that question. And maybe, you know, let's talk about that more because I think that's important. See a question coming in from Leanne about how many studies have been completed uh, about the erasure of native female voices within outdoor adventure education? Not nearly enough. In fact, we all can think of Sacagawea. And then whenever I give a talk, like that's why I did some research on uh, Lozen, who was in New Mexico, down in the Silver City area. I gave a talk recently in Nevada, and I highlighted two more Native women up there. I think that's, again, it's, it's, it's hidden from us, and we need to both change our perspective. I mean, if I, when I look at Lozen, who a friend named her daughter Lozen after that amazing leader, it's changing our perspective to realize that these are outdoor leaders. These are amazing leaders. And we just haven't seen them because we've been looking at um, you know, other, other people. So Leanne, I would say that that is something let's just start doing. There's another popular uh, venue of women who either went to the indigenous people in the early parts of the US uh, when Westerners came over or they um, were captured by the Indians and they decided to stay. It's like, yeah, this is what I like. I want to be here with these Native Americans. So there are, again, you know, probably a hundred books about that women have written about their experiences with Native Americans and saying, this is actually a bit better for me than living with the colonizers. I see Rick, Rick Metric, uh, another legend in experiential education, just said, thanks for this. It should be shared widely. I cannot agree enough. Not just, you know, because we're AEE and we want to tell the world, it's, this is a public service you're providing. This, this, I think if it gets spread out there, can really help change the way that, that we teach about this stuff. Uh, so important, so helpful. And folks, like I said, keep this in your vault, study it, share it, use it to become a better educator to all your students. Uh, and once again, Denise, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for putting this together. Uh, look forward to working with you again in the future. And I imagine we'll be seeing you in November in Orlando at our international conference, as usual. Um, and then also just want to tell the folks in the audience, if you like this webinar, AEE has a vault of resources like this. Uh, go to the website, aee.org slash webinars. You can look through the whole catalog. There's a little, little something in there for everyone. So you'll probably find something that relates to you and the work that you do. Uh, and plenty of other ways to get involved with the organization. Go to aee.org again, and hopefully we'll see all of you at the conference or at another webinar down the road.